Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert. The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. All right, I'm spotlighting you for everyone to see. And it is about half past the hour. I'd like to introduce uh, Neil McShane. He is going to be presenting on holding agile coaches accountable. This ought to be a good one, everyone. So listen up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And hello, everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Niall McShane. I, I work down in Australia and uh, a lot of folks down under are pretty progressive in their thinking with regards to the agile coaching space. So I'm, I'm privileged that we have a strong and thriving community here down under. Uh, so much so that we're always having heated debates around what it is that we do as a, uh, as a community, I suppose, or a collective of agile coaches. So uh, I got I got pretty passionate about this a couple of years ago and decided I'd write a book about what I think the answer is to to define this sometimes difficult um, practice of agile coaching, and I'll touch on a few of them today. Uh, all day every day, I uh, mentor and support agile coaches to perform and deliver outcomes for clients um, via the uh, company that I run and own called Source Agility. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, well, today we're going to talk about an interesting topic that um, <laughs> I think when we hear these words, performance management, people start to freak out a little bit. So I'm going to give us all a bit of a chance to, with this little uh, menti poll, to, to, to give us what you think of, three words that, that come up for you when someone might might approach you at the work in the workplace and uh, say to you they want to have a performance management conversation. <laughs> so jump over to menti.com and uh, let's put in let's put in uh, what we think is uh, some answers here to this question and. Uh, <laughs> it didn't take long for for the fun and games to start. Um, exactly, exactly. This is all the stuff that I I'm, I'm totally agree. You know, it's like oh my god, someone's someone's going to tell me that I'm doing a horrible job. Um, someone's going to uh, micromanage me. Um, let's give this a couple of seconds because I think. I I think it's I think it's worthwhile getting the view of the team here. So we've got six respondents. See if we can get ourselves up to maybe a few more. Uh, and look, while this is going on and people are putting their words in, what I want to say to everybody is part of what I wanted to do with this talk was reframe what it means to hold ourselves accountable for outcomes. Uh, to reframe what it means to talk about openly what it means, what performance means, what even high performance means for an agile practitioner. When we're out there trying to implement, influence complex human adaptive systems, we're not always, we don't always feel that we've got, you know, full control of the things that happen when we do our, when we do our role. So, so yeah, micromanagement seems to be seems to be uh, the top one of the top things. Okay, ours is in there, which is nice. Accountability, which is what we're going to talk about. Judgment, of course, the voice of judgment. Uh, process over people. Yeah, that's right. We're, try we're trying to put a box around a human being, which uh, can not feel very good. 
So uh, keep going with that, and um, I'll I'll share the results of of the of the Wordle of um, later on. But uh, let's 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 sort of get into this presentation. Um, I'll try to get this up for us. There we go. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, and thank you for your contribution. Keep keep putting some words in there, folks, and we'll have a look at that. We'll have a look at that um, at the end of the presentation, or I'll put it up on the on the on the mural. We're going to look at performance management, and 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 why is it so hard? Like, what is the problem? And we're moving from uh, agile to agility as a scrum master or a coach. Uh, how, 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 why is it that performance has become increasingly difficult to talk about? And I want to use performance metrics to enable safe safety, psychological safety in the workplace for us. Um, and agile coaches and anyone anyone really who's a practitioner, I think we can use performance manage, management in a positive way. Um, and then I think it's another passion of mine is to make sure that the role of agile coaches is really highly valued and sought after within the organisation. Um, there's always a challenge in a, in a transformation program when people have to start paying for the service of agile coaches, all of a sudden there's not as much demand. So so I'm going to talk about these themes today. I've got quite a bit to cover and I'm going to apologize in advance for talking at you. This is a webinar style format. I won't have a lot of breakouts. I'm going to be basically doing a bit of a knowledge transfer you transfer to you to try and provoke you into, into rethinking your role a little bit. So let's kick off. These four fellows. I wonder, I wonder just how aligned they are. And I'm going to talk a little bit here at the start around alignment. Uh, and what we can do to get more alignment, why alignment is so important for people like us who are out there as practitioners trying to affect change in, in a system. So I, I, I thought about outcomes and a lot of the challenges, because I manage agile coaches, I, I help them perform and be amazing. Um, and I also work with the people who are sponsoring the service. And, and both of those parties quite often have different perceptions on what is going on when an agile coach is doing their job. So I, I think we have an opportunity in the way we contract and engage and work with our sponsors to ensure that we're all aligned before we, before we kick off a piece of work. And really that's going to be at the heart of what we're going to discuss today. Making sure that when you go in and you're about to start or commence an engagement, that you have some alignment, not only amongst the coaches themselves or the scrum masters, but the person who owns the service within the organisation, often called a COE lead, um, a chapter lead, um, you know, people, people who own the service of agile coaching and represent it into the organisation. And then, of course, there's the people that will consume the service in the organisation that have a set of expectations. And I'm not sure about all of you out there, but I'm sure at least once you've gone out to do your job and then your client goes, I didn't want that's not what I need you to do. <laughs> and you're sort of stuck there thinking, well, this is awkward. <laughs> I, um, I think I'm here to enable human beings to be amazing and to help get work through a system. And, and this person thinks I'm going to be a project manager or a JIRA administrator or something. Um, the people who are paying for agile coaching or, or the scrum master service or agility practitioners, the sponsors, they need to be really clear what the investment is going to provide from a return perspective. Uh, and then everybody in and around the organisation is also looking at this line item, this expense item, unfortunately, uh, uh, for this service that's being provided. And we are quite expensive as knowledge workers, agile coaches and scrum masters. So relatively speaking, everybody needs to appreciate the value that we're bringing. And then, of course, a lot of what I do when I go into an organisation is to ensure we're attracting talent and building capability. And to do that, you need to be really clear on the outcomes you're expecting from an agile coaching service to attract the right people. Because at the moment in Australia, I'm not sure about where you are, but we have zero unemployment in the agile coaching market. There's no, there's nobody available. So everybody is being attracted out of their current role <laughs> to go to go to go to new roles. So we're going to talk um, about outcomes and we're going to talk about why is it what has changed in the last 10 years okay what has changed for us as practitioners in the last 10 years and I really want us to consider this because I think the competencies that we need today uh, it can be very overwhelming 
I'm mentoring uh, one of my staff at the moment, Laura. She's new. She's excited about coming into this world of being an agile practitioner, scrum master, and eventually a coach. And I keep talking to her about what she needs to learn to put in a, in, in a competency backpack, the things you need to collect along the way to actually just get started in what we do. Um, so I'm going to use this sort of metaphor just for a moment to help us reflect individually. I'd like you to reflect as you listen to me about what is in, what is in your backpack. What have you collected over the years in your learning, your, your, your education, your lived experience, your personal experience? Uh, because if you think about the practices that an agile coach needs to be able to execute just to be seen as baseline competent, and we go all the way back to sort of Lean Six Sigma, you've got SIPOX and value stream maps, you've got business processes and how they work to understand the current system, you've got team facilitation and managing crowds of people to co-create outcomes collectively, You've got things like scaled systems of work and scrum of scrums and connecting and managing dependencies. Then you've got the lovely world of, of PI planning and dependency management and managing 200 in a room to land a plan. You've got professional coaching, which is more and more becoming central to the expectations of, of what an agile coach can do. Leadership, I mean, it's a whole domain of knowledge, but we're expected to know about leadership, especially senior agile coaches, how we work and manage teams and dysfunctions in teams. And then, you know, all the way through to psychology and how we learn and unlearn. I mean, and you'll have to excuse this rather uh, crass <laughs> animation, but my point is you would need to be aware of at least some or, or hopefully all of these things to be to be aware of what's going on in the, in, in the industry around agile coaching, and it can be absolutely overwhelming. Lay on top of that, uh, there's, there's, there's bodies of knowledge, whole bodies of knowledge that we're expected to have some understanding of. And if you look at where we're progressing towards of recent times, there's this, we've started off, oops, we started off on, on the left here with, with, with Lean XP and then moving into Scrum. And nowadays, look where we are. We're talking about better value. We talk sooner and safer, keeping workforces happier with, and then we've got business agility. We've got all these sort of more, more contemporary ways of looking at the agility problem. So if you like, I've, I've represented here how we've moved from capital A Agile towards this agility movement and if you're a coach or an agile practitioner a scrum master there's an expectation that you're putting all these things into your backpack you're putting them into your knowledge repository and you're developing lived experience in each of these domains especially if you're wanting to move towards uh, senior roles or enterprise type roles and this can be overwhelming um, and it also adds to the conundrum or the problem that we're here to discuss today, which is how, the, how, how do we then manage performance? We've got all of these things. What does good look like? How do I know at the end of the week or month or quarter or year when I sit down with my practitioner, how do I know they've done a good job? And I'll let you in on, on, on the perception of the stakeholders. Um, the stakeholders are confused about what agile coaches are supposed to be giving them. Um, and they hire them and they don't quite know whether they're getting the things on the left, the things on the right, or both or all of it. Um, and therefore, um, expectation management is important and alignment, as I said previously. So I loved the, when I was invited to talk, um, I was really interested in this, in this tension that's developing um, when we talk about agility versus agile. And I'm going to build on that for the rest of the presentation as, you know, our backpacks had to collect all of these different things. The whole industry is starting to think very differently about agile practice adoption versus business agility outcomes. And I think it's upon us as practitioners to start shifting our thinking too. It's almost like the practice adoption is shifting into the background and most of our conversations are starting to become about different things than Agile. If you get stuck talking about Agile, you've almost lost your way as an Agile practitioner, which sounds wrong, right? 
But more and more business don't care about agile capital A. They just want to get things done. They just want to serve their customers. They just want more value delivered more frequently. Uh, and as practitioners, I suppose that's our challenge. How can we stop talking about agile and start helping the business solve problems? So another poll, just to break up me uh, talking at you. Um, I'll just get this one up. How's our word cloud going? Yeah, it's looking pretty good. Um, so here's another presentation. How are you going in your transition? So I've just laid it out to you and I've said, I've said, okay, we're on this journey. We're all on the journey, myself included, uh, from working a lot with the frameworks and how to implement them and, and how that uh, helps business versus probably more of, actually, it's probably more of a consulting stance, right? Where you're, you're working to solve problems and thinking about agility all day. Um, so where would you be on this continuum? Would you be, and, and, and folks, I just want to say one thing. There's no right or wrong. There's no good or bad. It is what it is, right? I, I have engagements where I'm very much all about um, implementing a framework because that's what the client wants. I know it'll get them there in the end, right? Uh, but there's other engagements where I'm brought in and, and someone's got a business problem and they know that they need to do something differently in terms of their operating model or their way of working. So I'd be interested to, uh, to see how, how everybody listening, um, you know, just your role now, where do you see yourself? It's interesting, isn't it? And, and I, I think in a way, as Agile grows up uh, and we start to see and we start to be perceived as a means to solve problems, business problems, um, we'll be invited into very different conversations. I think in the early days of my career, when I was more on the left of this continuum, I always sort of felt, well, why am I not getting invited to those meetings where the strategy happens. Why, do I, why don't I get a seat at the table when people are starting to set up these large transformation programs? And the answer that I think I'm starting to realise is because I was too much in agile and not enough in business agility. And a lot of the programs are uh, scoped out and, and set up against a business background or a business challenge or a business problem. But then somewhere along the line, uh, the coaches come in and they, they, they don't feel they had a seat at the table when it was getting set up. So I think more and more, if we can think about our role uh, as solving business problems, I think it'll position us at the table and help, and help organizations uh, and give us more agency as practitioners. Very good. So it looks like we're hovering around 3.3 out of five, which is, uh, and we're a bit bimodal, which means we have a group of people that are sort of on the left and a group of people that are moving towards uh, the other extreme. So interesting. Hopefully that's just provoking you to think a little bit about what you do in your role. That was, that was all the intent. It's not a judgment thing. It's not a good or bad thing. So where I want to move the conversation now, if we're, if we're thinking about performance and in this journey from agile to agility, is well, how could we how how could we look at some key results? Okay, well, what key results could we use to think about the work we're doing? And there's sort of this tension again between uh, are we looking at leading indicators of enablement or lagging indicators that that the business is is performing? And Honestly, uh, again, there's no right or wrong answers, but uh, uh, I am strongly encouraging agile coaches um, to think about the left as their home base, uh, whereas we need to encourage the business to own their outcomes um, because that's their job, which, which then means if we're starting to think about how we contract and hold ourselves accountable, we're, we're thinking more at the left on these leading indicators of enablement than we are on, on the right. And I know for as a fact, there'll be some people in industry that do not agree with that. 
And they would be thinking, well, no, agile coaches need some skin in the game um, in terms of business outcomes. And I'm, and I'm not suggesting for a moment that they shouldn't care about these things. But uh, what I am saying is if we're building a, a performance scorecard or some way to hold ourselves accountable as practitioners, I'd be very reluctant to put uh, business outcomes um, on my scorecard as an agile coach, but I'll be very keen to talk about how to set up um, a scorecard for, um, for the coach based on leading indicators of enablement. So let, let's move on and we'll keep this thing going. So coaches are a really diverse bunch and I'm going to talk about four people just briefly uh, to, make, to make my point. Um, here's these four people. They're a lovely group of coaches. Um, and I'm going to just take a little bit of a diversion just to make a point um, on why it's so hard for us as, as coaches to be held accountable to one way of talking about performance. And that's because we're all different and we all have different styles. So I would strongly encourage you to have a think and have a look at the social styles model. In fact, I'll give you a bit of a cheat sheet at the end um, in the download section where you can assess your own social style. But I, I want to take a moment to go through the model um, just to make the point that if we're trying to talk about performance for us as practitioners or agile coaches, um, we all have such diverse styles and, and then we have different backpacks with different competencies and it makes it very challenging. So the social styles is, I'll just give you a quick five minute. I think it's a really important knowledge nugget and you can take this away and have a, have a look. I've got some videos on my Vimeo channel. You can have a look at it as well. It essentially puts out puts it to you that we're all on a continuum between task oriented people oriented and asking questions versus giving advice. And I think for agile coaches, scrum masters, and anyone who's trying to enable change, it's, it's the, this is really useful um, because if we're task oriented um, tellers, we're gonna be driving outcomes of tasks. And if we're, if we're asking lots of questions around the work, we're going to be analyticals because we were inquiring. If we're asking lots of questions about the people in the system, we're amiable. We want safety and everybody to feel they have a place. If we're expressing and talking a lot about uh, to the people around us, that would make you an expressive. And you can see how I've renamed myself um, as an expressive in my title in Zoom. And I do that for the courses that I deliver. So we can all have an appreciation of their style and have some empathy and compassion for how we communicate. So why is this important? Well, it just means that um, coaches are going to be very diverse and very different in the way they approach their work. And I think uh, running one, one this, is the, this is what I'll give you afterwards and you can assess yourself and, and get your style. But if we go back to our coach, Dan, Dan is a driver. What does that mean? Well, it means Dan loves getting things done, right? So Dan, if he's deployed into an engagement, he will love to, to move things through the system and tick off the checklist and see work coming out of the system. Whereas Annie, she's analytical. So her pra the practices she really loves and engages in and as is in flow will be around system analysis. Whereas if Dan is stuck in system analysis, he's out of flow. He's like, for goodness sake, enough analysis paralysis, let's get some work done. And then we've got Elaine and she's an expressive. So expressive people love having their ideas validated by the people in the room. That's why they talk so much. Okay, so I'm an expressive. I love sharing my ideas. So, so Elaine, the expressive, loves innovation work because it's all about new ideas. And then finally, we have Alex, and she's an amiable. She loves psychological safety, making sure everybody feels included, and it's an inclusive environment. And just for the sake of the discussion today, I've said, well, she loves doing design work, divergent thinking, making sure it gets the collective wisdom of the crowd. So if you're managing an agile coaching service, or this could equally apply to Scrum Masters, it, it, it doesn't really matter. This is a people thing, not an agile coaching thing. But the challenge I continually face is I'm brought in to establish an agile coaching service and I've got these, this collective of people all with different styles, all with different backpacks, all with different competencies. And it presents a super difficult challenge because everybody, you know, Alex goes off and does her thing and it's completely different to Dan. 
And that presents a challenge for everybody, including the practitioners, because they, they go in to the clients internal to the organization and they do their thing. They get in flow. Alex works to her strengths, Dan to his, Annie to hers, et cetera. Um, and we end up with this really difficult problem, really difficult problem, which is, you know, agile coaches do what they know, not what is needed. And you could substitute scrum masters, agile, you know, practitioner, practitioners generally. And of course, this is just a provocation. It's not a truth. But my experience is, and, and human beings will, will generally default to what they're good at, what they know, what they've got lived experience in. And the challenge for us when we're serving people in the organisation is uh, quite often that doesn't line up with what the expectation was or what is needed in that moment. So really, that's why I've started to think about it, um, this challenge. And, you know, where I've landed is there's a few things we need to think about. Uh, and one is working with the individual coaches to help them understand these patterns that they have, these styles that they have, and these, these uh, biases that they have for doing things in certain ways. And then, uh, and the other one is to work with the organization to put in an accountability system where we can work with these challenges um, and hopefully provide some solutions. And I'll get to that in a minute. But before I do that, I wanted to just look at the architecture of a habit. And this is not, you know, new thinking. Uh, it's been around a long time, but I wanted to share it with you because if you're sitting here listening to this presentation and you're starting to think, oh yeah, goodness me, I'm very much biased towards doing what I do in one particular way, um, or my style is so dominant in like I'm such a driver, or I'm such a, an analytical, I really, I really think I need to have some flexibility, then you know, this type of um, talking about your habits and your routines and your cues and your rewards is useful, is just useful. So I'll spend a couple of minutes on it. The neuroscientists uh, essentially are saying here that we are queued up to run automatic routines, these habits that we have as practitioners. So someone comes in and they go, how do I prioritize my backlog? You'll be going, yep, that's me. I'm on. I know about that. I'm queued up and you step in and you run a routine. Now, the routine could be you rolling up your sleeves. Let me show you how to do it. Or the routine might be to say something and provide some knowledge. Or the routine might be ask a question. What do you know about backlog prioritization? Right? One's a coachy stance. One's a driver stance. One's a, a telling stance. Right? You will run whatever routine is your normal one, probably. If you've got some flexibility, you might pause there and go, is my normal routine the right one right now? Should I ask a question or should I tell the person the answer? Regardless, we want to get to a reward where we see the person learning and the team progressing and we get that reward that, yes, I've helped, I've had an impact today. So I just wanted to leave that with you to consider. So if you've collected your competencies over the years into your backpack, if you've got a dominating way that you go about your role, I'm just suggesting <clears throat> possibly you might have an unlearning opportunity. And that's essentially what this model is saying. It's um, what routine could we substitute on occasion instead of running the same one? So where does that leave us with, you know, and, I, and this, this is sort of where I've arrived and I put it together a little system I'm going to take you through today, just briefly, um, that I think can help guide us when we're wanting to think about performance in an engagement. And, and I really think even as an individual, if you're heading in for an engagement, you could use the principles I'm going to take you through here um, to help you ensure that you've got alignment. I was doing a time check, just bear with me. Uh, so we're using, um, we're going to have some questions at the end, aren't we? So we've got, what time are we finishing on? Um, just uh, 6.15. So we've got 15 minutes left. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's about right. Yeah, okay. So I'll move through this content and then and then we can we can open up for questions. So, so what I wanted to show you through here is a very simple, oops, a very simple process and to, to build some accountability in your practice. And my animation has gone all weird. So I'm just going to show you the slide. So let's let's say you show up for an engagement. Here's what I'd like you to do. 
actively ask people, what is the area of focus here that you need me to address? Okay, and I'll take you through some examples in a minute, but let, let, I'll give you one. Someone might say, and this is more for agile coaches, but it equally applies to, to senior scrum masters who are looking at um, influencing the system of work around the team. So someone might say, okay, well, I need you to help shift the mindset of, of, of the leader who sponsors this, this, this system of work. And you go, okay, not a problem. So you need to then baseline what's going on. Like, is this person on board? Um, is the stakeholder willing to be coached? Is there coaching going on right now? What are they a supporter of the change or a resistor to the change? So that's one example of a focus area. Another might be um, you've been brought in to move, move the team and, and the surrounding stakeholders from milestones and activity to value. Okay, that's a focus area. We have to focus on shifting our language and how we plan and prioritize towards value. So you would need to then go in and look at the system of work and assess, well, where are we in that transition? Well, we're still talking about, you know, shipping features, you know, like a feature factory. We're not talking about business value. That move from agile to agility has not happened. So you now know that's a focus area. So then you'd need to say, well, okay, as a practitioner, what are the practices I'm going to bring to bear? What are the practices I need to be held accountable to delivering? And I'll give you an example around value. So you might um, implement an OKR education campaign. You might uh, take one or two teams and roll out the OKR process into how they do governance, planning and reporting. Um, and then the stakeholders would have that expectation. If you've aligned on those as measures, those observable measures of the practices being executed, you then are starting to get a fit between what the stakeholders are asking and what practices you can bring. And then you're happy to be held accountable. And if you, if you can contract that handshake at the start of your engagement, it creates a very safe environment for you. The challenge we face is when people are brought in to do work and they just deployed into a team and they haven't had that handshake around what they're supposed to be doing. Recently, I was with a client and a new coach was starting. One of my coaches was starting with a new client and they just charged off and mobilized teams. And I asked them, well, have you looked at the focus area of value? Do you know what the teams are supposed to be delivering? Oh, no, we just need to start agile. And that's a perfect example of that contrast between agile and business agility. So I, I slowed everybody down and went through this process and said, okay, define value for me. And they struggled. We spent 20 minutes talking around what, what value was. And after that, after that meeting, what became really evident was we need to slow down on mobilizing teams before until we know what value we need to deliver. That sounds really simple. Uh, but many, many times I see agile coaches and scrum masters charging off into a system of work without taking the time to agree on the focus areas and then the associated practices and then measures of those practices. So here's the focus areas. And if you're going to remember a slide, I'd, I'd encourage you to remember this one. If you go into a system of work, are you engaged with the leader? Yes or no? If you're not, um, or you don't have the skills to engage with leaders, and it's a little bit above where you're normally used to working, I encourage you to at least ask the question of your manager or the people around you about how you might be able to address the leader and talk to them about their behavior and mindset. Otherwise, if you're working at the team level, sooner or later, you're gonna run into a leader or a per person of influence, um, a senior person who's gonna be disruptive to what you're trying to get done. Um, so that's a key focus area. It's why it's at the core of my little model that I've got here for you today. The, the second focus area that I encourage all scrum masters and coaches and agile folks to consider when they go in to do an engagement is making things visible. And I've always said this, the first thing anybody should do is make the system be able to be seen and have a shared understanding of it. So um, strongly consider you consider, I encourage you to, to, to focus on that irrespective of your engagement. This one is this delivering change into the system. I have found many coaches and especially scrum masters have not had agency. In other words, they have not had the ability to change the system that they're working in. That sounds 
like an oxymoron. But um, delivering change into the system and knowing where it's blocked and not working and dysfunctional, um, often, often people don't have the power to do that. They have to, for example, team design. No, this is the team. Just, just implement Scrum with this team. And I think it's really sad that we don't or are unable to address that focus area and have an influence and agency on changing what the team design is and proposing different ones and rearranging processes that have been held for a long time. I mean, of course, some of us do, but I'm just provoking you to have a think about, do you actually change the system or just implement agile into the old system? The last one is around value and OKRs and um, measurements and metrics around um, delivering value by the system. And this is, you know, delivery predictability, um, time to value, um, process efficiency to deliver value. And in every engagement, I use these, I use these four measures um, to talk to and negotiate and contract with, with people when, before I go in. And then I set up some practices around each of them. And it's those practices that we're held accountable for. It's the practices we're held, we're executing them well to provide the sponsor or the people we're coaching with what they need to do their job and enable agility. So here's an example from a recent client workshop. They wanted me to provide agility, uh, coaching support and OKR design workshops. The focus areas were value and leadership. The core practices were OKR methods and professional coaching. And then the measures were, do we have good coaching relationships with all the right stakeholders? And are we using value to plan and prioritize work? So what that now means is, if you're asking me what my performance scorecard is, it's, it's, it's these things here, okay? Everybody is agreed that we're going in on these focus areas, we're gonna do these things, and when they're done, they can be seen to be executed, okay? They're leading indicators enabling agility. Um, the good thing is if you're running a team of coaches, you can also then say, okay, well, who can do OKRs? I'm doing this with this team at the moment. There's 12 people in the team. We've just ramped up the team. And we're trying to create our service catalog around, and one of them is around value and OKRs and executing workshops around helping the business adopt that practice. But only 20% of the team knows how to do that. Only 20% of the team has the knowledge and even a smaller amount have the experience of facilitating that workshop. So what does that mean? Well, that means when we performance manage them, we're not making them feel judged or micromanaging them or making them do things they can't do. We're educating and developing them. So that's how I use performance management. I set up the focus areas, the practices and the measures. And then I say, here's the scoreboard, who needs training or development or how do we supplement the team to ensure we have that capability. And it also encourages pair coaching as well. So if I know a bit about this and you know a bit about that, we go in together and we can do the job and deliver the service together. So that's just a quick example. And I'll leave that with you. Um, but you know, engaged leaders, the values there, um, that's the example I talked you through. So I've just itemized that out for you and I'll give it to you in the PowerPoint back. Uh, and there's many other focus areas depending on your context, but uh, I just think we need to do that work before we start the engagement. So what are some tips if we're building some accountability into your coaching service? Well, you do it with people, you don't do it to them, okay? So all of those words you, you, you brought up but in the cloud, in the word cloud, about micromanaging and all of these sort of, you know, putting, putting a process over me. The whole point of this is to co-create it with everybody. So we all agree on the core practices. We all agree on what it means to execute a service in a focus area, rather than um, this being a management thing. And then you can make sure all parties agree what the service catalog is and isn't and what we do and don't do. Uh, and then we can use performance and accountability to boost safety because coaches are only asked to execute practices that they're competent in and have sponsorship to execute. So it's really that third bullet point, I think, which is why I designed this. So everybody can feel that they're in flow and executing um, the skills that they've got and learning the things that they need to, to fulfill the service. Um, and then, and then what, what I've experienced is once we get this right, we're meeting expectations as a service and we're getting more demand for our service because we're focusing on the areas that matter to the organization. 
So, so yes, yeah, so I've built a tool around this, which I won't take you through now, um, but we are running a follow-up. I do have another webinar in a, in a few weeks. If you're interested, you're most welcome to come along and hear about that. Um, but this is how I do it in the business. I go in, I run an audit on the system of work before I start, and then we can see where the focus areas are lacking and we know what to do to remediate that challenge to enable agility. I'm just saying there's a bit of rigor around this. So let's do a recap. We've got the backpack. So think about your backpack. What are your capabilities and competencies? And what have you collected along the way? And what might you have to learn? We've got this idea of leading indicators that enable agility as being our focus area. And we're not taking ownership of the business agility outcomes. That's not us. We are looking at enabling agility, not owning business outcomes. I introduced the idea of different styles of coaching and how if we're to think about performance management, we need an appreciation, <clears throat> excuse me, that everybody's different, our styles are different. So we can't run one, one performance management framework um, that, that is biased towards drivers or analyticals. We need an appreciation of everyone's styles. Then I talked about habits and how we have to think about the normal routines that we habitually run. And as practitioners, we need to, we need to consider, at least consider that maybe I should alter some of my routines. As we move from capital A Agile to Agility, the things I normally do, do I need to reconsider those? So I challenge you to, to, to think about that. And then finally, focus areas, uh, and then building a set of consistent practices around each focus area is, is something that'll provide you with the ability to feel safe as you engage. And if you can contract that up front and reach agreement and consensus on the practices, associated with each of these focus areas, then we're going to be much, much better um, prepared and set up to learn, grow and develop um, in a safe environment. So that is about all I had. <clears throat> I'll, put, I'll put the links to the webinar if you want to come along and learn a little bit more around um, that agility tool. And I've also got a white paper you can, you can download, which um, I'll put in on the mural board as well, if you're interested in how to manage the performance. It talks about all what we've done in a little bit more detail. So whew, that was a little bit of a run to the finish line. Um, happy to do a few questions now for people. got some um, chat yeah just a okay, quick that. one um if you can hear me um can an okr coach and an agile coach work together for an organization uh, i think so i mean i mean that's an interesting new role that's come up isn't it this idea that there's a sort of domain expert that coaches people um the short answer is absolutely um, and i've done it yes. many times yeah and they should i think and, and Maybe that needs to be something you contract, right? So, okay, if you're, but, but OKRs as a practice takes a lot of mindset change and a lot of behavioral change. It's, it's, it's not just about the body of knowledge on OKRs, it's the adoption of it, it's the challenge. Thank you. Oh, can you talk more about the development of metrics and some of the challenges that? I, that you can face. Um, yes, yes. Um, the, 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 as we move from agile to agility, one of the biggest gaps in the practitioners is, is things like OKRs and value stream mapping um, and process, which is not new stuff, right? I mean, Lean's been doing this for decades. So it's ironic now that when we're trying to think about how much value we're delivering, how frequently um, that it's almost like uh, value stream mapping has become, uh, it's made a comeback, um, as well as PMI, uh, very strong on thinking about how value gets delivered um, with their disciplined agile approach. So the challenge I have when I'm doing um, metrics is getting, getting the sponsors of the agile coaching service to agree what we don't do. Uh, recently, I've been coaching a team of coaches, 12 coaches, and their sponsor um, to stop being project managers. And when, you know, there's nothing wrong with project managers. We need to manage dependencies and complexities, but um, they wanted more drivers. So that driver type, they wanted drivers. And um, all the coaches were sort of saying, this is not what I want to do. It's not why I was hired. This was not in the job ad. 
So, um, so that that's some of the challenges I faced is when the sponsor wants drivers and different types of personas and the coaches were were invited in thinking one thing. Yeah. Some agile data that I look at regarding outcomes. Um, well, if you if you go all the way to business agility and you want to talk about that, the, the, the metrics I use, it's lead time to value. That, that, that's my top one. So how long does it take to go from proposing what you need from a business perspective to having that, having that value shipped and realized? What's the lead time? And then you can look at the stream of activities that, that, that impede or support the flow of work through that system. So that's my one. And then, you know, the guardrails around that, uh, you know, are the people, are the people in the system thriving? Uh, and are we managing quality and um, effectively? Um, but yeah, that Jonathan Smart's Jonathan Smart stuff is pretty good. So I'd have a look at better value sooner, safer, happier on that. Any other questions? I think we're at time then. Yes, I believe we are. Thank you so much, Neil.